So welcome to uh, the very first uh, webinar for the UCL Critical Centre for Critical Heritage Studies. Um, we have three speakers um, today and the title of which is Craft China Exhibition Making at the Chinese National Museum of Ethnology and this is an AHRC Newton funded project uh, located at the institute that is next networked between the Institute of Archaeology, UCL, um, and our uh, Chinese partners. So we've got a network today which goes from London to Beijing. Uh, so our, our first um, speaker up today is Dr. Lo Pan, who is the lead curator um, of the Chinese National Museum of, of Ethnology in um, Beijing. And she's going to talk about exhibition making. So should I start? Please do. Oh, I'm Beverly oh, Butler, oh. by the way. Sorry, I'm chairing <laughs> it. And sorry, that's that's less important than anything else. But I'm Beverly Butler from the Centre for uh, Critical Heritage Studies. So yes, please do, Pan. Well, thank you, Professor Butler. Appreciate for the kind introduction. And hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here online. Um, today I'm going to introduce something we are trying to do in the National Museum of Ethnology in China in the context of creative economy. And now you can see my title is um, Tradition at Present. Um, in, um, so before I start, probably I have to um, introduce the contents that I'm going to talk about. So uh, this is what I'm going to talk about. First, I'll go to the background information uh, that listed. Um, in the major part, I'm going to talk about the tradition at present. Um, it's an exhibition that we created. In the China Craft, it's a project that is an ongoing project. And then I'm going to talk about uh, where the future started by the Chinese National Museum of Ethnology. So, First of all, I'm going to uh, talk about background information. What does ethnic minority mean in China? Well, China as a united multinational uh, state is composed of 56 ethnic groups. Han Chinese are known as the majority. In addition to the Han Chinese, you know, there are 55 ethnic minority groups within mainland China and Taiwan were officially recognized before 1980s. Um, here you can see a very classic picture about China's um, ethnic minorities. In the first uh, impression, I guess, from the picture, it's always their customs. So um, another question will be, uh, where or what is Chinese National Museum of Ethnology? Of course, that's the place I'm working for. But um, it was in 1956, Professor Fei Xiaotong, that I assume you all know him very well, have a speech proposing the establishment of the National Ethnographic Museum. Due to a reflection of anthropology as a colonial discipline, Fei point out that most Western ethno uh, ethnology museums display only those identified as barbaric artists. Hence, he suggests, like what I uh, listed. Um, we should never follow the routine of capitalism, where they study their own culture as folklore and uh, other ethnic groups as ethnology. Therefore, I object to label the, those museums as that collected, uh, collect, study, and display Han people's life as a museum of folklore, and those that display the ethnic groups as a museum of ethnology. In my opinion, uh, these two types should be collectively called Museum of Nationality. That here is a new concept. That's the Museum of um, Nationality is intended to create a new type of museum that is different from the Museum of Ethnology. But there is no doubt that when Fate uh, say that, he has no intention to exclude the National Museum from uh, Ethnology. Well, the first state-run Museum of Nationality in China was constructed in the 1950s. It was designed to celebrate the decennial celebration of PRC and to demonstrate how the state take care of uh, minority nationalities, named the Cultural Palace of Nationality. This palace integrates hotel, uh, library, theater, conference hall, and museum together. The first exhibition in this Cultural Palace of Nationality 
was held in 1959, right after the building was completed. Um, the name of the exhibition was Brilliant Achievement of Works with um, Minority Nationalities in 10 Years. Since then, until 1979, for each decennial celebration, the Cultural Palace of Nationality should, would hold an exhibition on a topic of 10 years achievement. Sometimes they do tempo, um, temporary exhibitions, but uh, a unified um, uh, a, a multinational state or the diversity of Chinese ethnic culture was never used as a topic of them. From the 1980s, the Cultural Palace of Nationality was encouraged to develop its own business. This fire exhibition hall had been used for commercial purpose. In the 1990s, and even till today, oceans of people come to, for um, its commercial film, but its function of museum has commonly been forgotten. So in the 1980s, some anthropologists, well actually Fei Xiao Tong again, once again proposed the ex establishment of a single function national museum of ethnic minority. Besides the cultural palace of national uh, nationality, since 1990, there has been a boom in the, the construction of ethnic museum uh, in China. In many provinces, regions, and cities, they all have established uh, their own museum of nationalities. Um, as the only national level museum of ethnology, the new established Chinese National Museum of Ethnology was considered an important part of the multi-project in association with state making in uh, nation building, functioned in representing uh, various ethnic minority in shape witness in China. Witness here uh, means Chinese nation as a whole. Um, this was the initial motivation when it was first proposed, but it could also be the major reason that caused its difficulty situation at present. That is why we see a lack of a permanent building. The major text that uh, the Chinese National Museum of Ethnology undertaken was to show the formation of Chinese nation. The historical process of um, Asian nationality in the assimilation in conflicts that create greater China by material evidence, that is by ethnic artifacts. It ends at explaining the pattern of diversity in unity of Chinese nation, legitimizing the territory inherited from history in enhance the identity of Chinese nation. Um, by so doing, the Chinese National Museum of Ethnology tied itself to the pursuit of the long-term historical continuity of, of the Chinese nation. But um, the concept of nation is relatively recent. While the activity of ethnic groups in history was extremely complex, the same making process requires a reintegration of history by including the changing complex groups into a nation state narrative framework. So, um, how were the ethnic minorities normally reinterpreted? Here I'm going to show some pictures. Um, due to the major text that I mentioned above, most exhibitions have to start with historical evidence that prove the uh, particular ethnic groups have lived in the territory of China from ancient times. And second, they have to describe their importance in the creation of the Chinese nation throughout history, like their achievement in technology or art. Um, last but not least, they have to introduce and uh, include important activities, especially revolutionary history. Like the one I, uh, the picture I um, used here, it was been taken in the multiple museum of ethnology in Yunnan. It's actually listed uh, all the um, ethnic groups in their territory. And of course, the Rotan was exactly the same way that uh, I just mentioned. The representation of ethnic minority always ends up creating a unique unity. Um, the unity in the national level or the unity of a, uh, uh, like, uh, the provincial level or even in the municipal level. Of course, although this narrative mode occupied in the basic exhibition in many uh, regional museums of ethnology, it is not the whole story we have to know. Beyond the major text, there are some other different ways to display ethnic minorities in touring or temporary exhibitions. But still, you can see some pictures like that. Uh, like the Miao people, 
were singing and dancing in a stage, or um, separating into different uh, subgroups, uh, wearing those um, looks very uh, exotic uh, costumes, or um, using a picture to show their uh, normally uh, the, the living environment, or those um, arts or tools that they made, and also these beautiful exotic clothing as well. So um, since um, ethnic customs have been mentioned that often, here you can see um, it is kind of the most important ethnic artifact in all these museums of nationality. So how to challenge the frozen impression and how to make innovation of ethnic clothes exhibition become more difficult? That is very important. So that is the case I'm going to introduce today. Tradition at present is an exhibition created by uh, Chinese National Museum of Ethnology in 2016. It is an exhibition about traditional clothing of Chinese ethnic minority groups in their present, um, present reinterpretation. So here I'm going to show you the video. The exhibition had four units. It begins with the screen time. In the first unit, we try to emphasize the making and wearing of clothing is a process that for, follows seasonal changes. This um, institution that you just seen was named Sewing Time. The institution ha uh, hands 24 colored uh, blue dyed clothing strips of varying types of color. Um, it was been immersed in a huge divert in exactly of 24 solar terms. I will go back to that later. And this part is about closing is closely intertwined with the historical memories of individuals, families, and ethnic groups by uh, wearing in special events. Like in rituals, in the weddings, or funerals. The second unit explores the various ways that clothing is related to space, like how clothes themselves constitute a space as expressed through their shape or structure, how clothes reflect living environments, and how clothes construct the relationship between human beings in the universe. We find that drawing a symbol with special meaning on clothes help people establish some um, in an interpretable order between themselves and the universe. Like this part so is basically the living environment. The third part section here introduces the process of garment making, including the often very simple tools and natural materials utilized. The reason we use craft here was because, as we all know, the modern era was said to start from textile technology in um, 1785. The availability of steam engage, um, engines um, revolutionized the textile uh, industry, known as Industrial Revolu um, Revolution. Uh, heralding the modern era. Clothes were not made by machines in handmade ethnic clothing become unfashionable. However, even today, the influence of traditional garments still linger on. So we try to ask our questions here. Is there really such a big gulf between so-called tradition and modernity and between handmade and machine-made? So the last part is um, we make a, a mix match, uh, mixing match, and also we invite the 
people, audience to do some interaction here. Um, this part is um, just been sold in, as the, uh, for, in the first units. In ancient China, Chinese people um, divide the circle of the annual motion of the sun into 24 equal segments. Because the dye coloring is closely related to the temperature, the color of the clothes strip also change from, um, from shallow to deep as the weather change from cold to warm. Um, hanging in the middle is a dress from Yi people, which is also an ethnic minority. The dress was made by um, 365 pieces of blue dyed clothes, one of which is sewn every day for a year. We use this installation to represent the rotation of the four season that clothing making should follow. Uh, so by this installation, we want to show how people construct the relationship between themselves in the universe in a very small space on their own clothing. Uh, for example, an um, orthogonal pattern in some pattern was widely used in the ethnic clothings in China. People imagine that in this way, the body realized the connection with universe and give the protection. So the designers have us to create a sense of people being in the universe. The uh, unit four is still a, uh, a prototype. We continue to interview audience in different cities, try to understand their view on traditional and modern. Um, these interviews will be used as materials for the next um, exhibition tour. Now we start to interview designers who uh, focus more on ethnic custom, get to know their ideas and puzzles. We hope this unit will be our laboratory to realize the link between people and sense and between tradition and modernity. Um, now we start another project, then China Club. Um, this project is to uh, further explore how the museums present living culture of ethnic groups. The name um, of it was actually will be uh, explained further by David. Um, you might know that it was in 2004, China joined the UNESCO Convention of the Protection of ICH, uh, Intangible Cultural Heritage. And soon we witnessed a new ICH boom in these 15 days, 15 years. Um, in the list of heritage, uh, ICH, handicraft of ethnic minorities occupy a large part of the list. So now we try to, um, based on the data of field work, uh, we try to um, show the current status of uh, different handicraft from different ethnic minorities. Similar with tradition at present, the ongoing process um, project is, in, is also an attempt to a new narrative of ICH. Um, you might know that a policy was tried to balance the preservation with creative transformation in innovative development and uh, China traditional craft revitalization plan was issued in 2015. Craft are encouraged to involve in order to be used in contemporary life. Um, it was been witnessed, the boom was been witnessed after 2015. The value of design was never been more emphasized, especially to those uh, crafts in ethnic areas. So the first example will be the dye pottery. Um, dye pottery was made by Dai people. In 2004, dye pottery was the first batch of uh, handicraft listed as uh, National Intangible Cultural Heritage. Um, Dai people live in Xishuang Banna, Yunnan, in China. Um, we went there in August 2019. In, we have seen several development directions of this intangible cultural heritage handicraft. Um, the traditional Dai pottery can be seen divided into two directions. Um, we still see these two types uh, at present, like uh, in the, uh, the pot, the, the traditional shape of dye pottery um, was made basically by women, and the statues was made by skilled men for temples. Um, however, the dye pottery we saw in Xishuang Banna have developed into more complicated situation. 
that we can see there are dye pottery factories specializing in the production of tourism souvenirs. In, in the, the picture on the right, on, on the right hand side, that is some villages was being developed into a special sport where every household made pottery in order to meet the needs of tourism development. When visitors arrived, they teach tourists to how to make pottery and sell, uh, sell cheap pottery um, and even um, competing with each other in a price war. But we can also see that um, on the left hand side is a dye pottery statute by a, a national um, inheritor of dye pottery uh, who still use traditional technology, who make vessels in the uh, figure of Buddha. They also try to feed the, uh, the need of contemporary life. But also we see young artists travel along the wall and come back to Hong Kong, redesign a shape in function of dye pottery while using both traditional technologies in modern designs. Um, we meet a young artist in Xichuang Banna who spent her college time in Thailand in two years and spent to learn modern art. In we can see a lot of uh, young insiders going out and bring back new ideas that was being commonly seen in these years. But the problem is what kind of dye pot potteries will be collected by museums? Of course, we know that according to the collection uh, management, um, only the traditional shape will be collected. So still in the museums, if you want to sew ICH, probably you will just see the still frozen, the, those, um, those, those potteries that frozen in time. And one of our, our case is supported by an enterprise. It is under a great framework named the Chinese New Folk Art, launched by a modern art foundation in Beijing in 2015, which aims to connect handicraft um, practitioners with innovative in, in, um, enterprise through preliminary study in a reasonable uh, allocation and develop new products that meet current needs with temporary art and design. Um, by learning about the current living situation of the Dulong in characters, um, the, their characteristic of the multi-ethnic uh, culture in the region, there's a project that was Nats Nats. They did not donate money to help the local people, but uh, after a few research, uh, their project team decided to start with Dulong blankets and develop into a clothing or other products. That's the Dulong blanket was originally looks like very colorful. Um, they invite a group of young Dulong women, bring them to some big city for uh, technique training, and then uh, let them turn to their own hometown to organize the production of local Dulong blankets, which was be redesigned like this. Uh, it was being sold. Um, they changed the material into cashmere or wool, and then uh, redesign the color. You can see it's not that colorful at all. But there are still a lot of puzzles by the designers. Like when we interview a designer who also involved in that kind of design, that's what she said. We have done a lot of projects. The biggest problem that we face is not about how to design the most beautiful pillow or um, bags or fabric, but how to establish a stable local community. Because only when the community is established can the craft be extended further. Also, in order to, um, for it to last longer, the newly designed product had to find its place in the present. So what kind of problems do they face? Can we anthropologists bring these problems into museum ex exhibition and invite audience to join the discussion? Maybe this is another way to make invisible things being seen. So what are we trying to do by these two projects? And can anthropologists create a future? We make traditional oppression a touring exhibition. It is an attempt to present a different narrative about ethnic minorities in China rather than a grand narrative of Chinese nation as a whole. We try to provide an anthropological perspective, 
made our audience understand the current living condition of different ethnic groups. We pro provide a fear sense, make the invisible life in cultural diversity which was been buried by grand narrative being seen. We hope to give our audience some new impression that the ethnic culture is not frozen in the past or in the museums. The creative economy has opened a new door to, uh, for traditional handicraft. Creativity uh, challenges the general concept of the authenticity of ICH handicraft in ethnic uh, artifacts. Um, you know, ethnic crafts no longer need to be maintain their authenticity or be um, solidified into cultural relics. Usually, because of the museum's collection management, only objects that I just mentioned with authenticity or long history will be collected. Um, but in this way, the message to the audience is distinctly, distinctly different from what anthropologists see in the film. And now we are not only trying to reveal the concealed culture, but also inviting the audience to join the discussion of a creatable future. So that is, um, anthropologists might not be able to save the world, but still we are trying a new way for a new uh, narrative. Thank you and all the comments and questions are welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, I think um, I shall at this point um, uh, begin um, sort of on, on behalf of the, uh, the UCL team, um, which has um, since 2018 been following the projects that uh, Pan has just shared with us. And the UCL team, what we call um, the Craft China project, uh, which is Bev, Mike Rowlands, David Francis and myself um, have been trying to do a kind of participant observation of uh, the Chinese National Museum of Ethnology, um, observing, doing an ethnography almost of a bunch of anthropologists sort of at work of making exhibitions or different uh, exhibitions about um, uh, Chinese ethnic um, heritage. And um, so Craft China is framed within the sort of broader context of looking at the creative economy development in China with the aim to understand the remaking process of ethnic craft heritages in China um, nowadays. And uh, the China's creative economy, which is rendered um, in Chinese as the cultural creative industries, what, what, what people call Wenchuan Chanye, in Chinese is a predominantly um, state-led socio-economic socio program of the magnitudes of a nationwide movement, which has been going on um, for give or take 15 years now. And um, it has undergone um, two, roughly two distinct um, phases. And the first phase, which would be seen as based on a more sort of direct appropriation of the Euro-American uh, model, which has been first defined and implemented in the UK um, of, of creative economy. And uh, this phase, starting around 2005, has witnessed a nationwide creation of specific zones in cities for cultural industries, or Wenchuan areas, as they call it. Um, and cultural innovation and the creative industries have then become a key element in the government's um, policies and also developmental schemes and urban planning programs. And the second phase, which happened more recently, um, since 2015, um, featured a, a, a kind of a, a broader, which is called mass entrepreneurship and mass innovation or Da Zhong Chuang Ye, or Da Zhong Chuang Xin, which was initiated by the Premier Li Keqiang um, in roughly 2015, which was focused on pro providing platforms and opportunity for a sort of wider part of the population to be part of the entrepreneurial class, um, to be able to, uh, to participate in the creative economy. 
So from what Pan just shared, we see a, um, an ongoing process where the original um, cultural creativity rooted in the ethnic craft traditions are being allowed um, with various means to reach wider national and even global platforms and audiences and uh, customers through, um, through either the creative individuals themselves absorbing and reinterpreting the design languages um, and technologies taken from the outside um, or working with agencies um, that help with, with that as well as adopting commercial and entrepreneurial means which are enabled by this uh, broader promotion of creative economy in China. In, in this context, this process is, 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 is bringing fundamental changes to the ethnic communities and how the value of their craft heritage is understood and um, transmitted and, and how um, sort of these communities um, form their relationship with their heritage. And so it is a process uh, to me of, of both opportunities and um, potentially problems. So what we are doing, so we, we, we try to, so we, we reversed Pan's project, or the museum's project, China Craft to Craft China, using craft, the term, um, as an adjective in um, what we are commonly nowadays um, to, to imply sort of what we sort of com nowadays commonly associate um, with the term as in um, craft um, beer or craft um, as, as a, to, impl um, to imply a sense of um, handmade artisanship and uh, uh, because craft itself is becoming indicative of a new idea of cultural and heritage value. So it is, it is the shift in that um, conceptualization of, of the cultural value that we are, we are trying to absorb and understand here. And the museum, in, or Chinese museums, um, which, is, which has been the space where ethnic cultures have been represented in China, but inev inevitably, have to respond to these shifts and what they might um, entail. So um, on this note, I shall pass on to my colleague, um, David Francis, to talk about remaking craft and make, remaking exhibitions. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, Lee. Um, yeah, that was a really good kind of introduction to the project. So my name's Dr. David Francis. And as well as being a researcher at the Institute of Archaeology, I also make exhibitions. Um, so I've worked at the British Museum and the Grand Egyptian Museum. And so I'm really interested in the parallels that can be drawn between the remaking of traditional ethnic minority crafts in the creative economy in China and the remaking of exhibitions as well, which I think is really interesting. Um, because I think one of the questions that that comes out of this project is where does kind of the new thing that you're remaking kind of come from? So Pam gave us that example of the Dulong uh, women involved in the textile weaving where that was being made new and you had these outside designers, the kind of Nazi Nazi uh, collective coming from Beijing in and you can kind of see uh, kind of newness coming from the field of design and I think what's also interesting that within Pam's own exhibition uh, which we saw that video of that gave us a striking kind of impression of how this differs from previous ethnic minority exhibitions, that Pan's collaborating with the same sort of designers or designers who are working in the same field who are also involved in these collaborations that are remaking these ethnic minority crafts. So you have, you know, design as this kind of source of newness that gives value both to the museum exhibition to allow that to reinvent itself and also to the crafts as well. But I think what's also interesting, especially from a kind of European uh, museum making perspective, is the idea that creativity and innovation doesn't just come from, say, modernization, but also from rediscovering the past. And I think, you know, that's suggested in the dialogue between past and present in the exhibition title, Tradition at Present. 
Now, within the field of critical museology, a lot of the focus on Chinese museums is on that first half of the 20th century that the museum is a kind of a technology of modernity that's imported from elsewhere, from Europe, from North America, from Japan. But increasingly, there's been a recent interest in Chinese forms of museums and display that are kind of come from within. And that might be, be at Nantong Museum in uh, Jiangsu province at the start of the 20th century, at the end of the kind of dynastic period, which is often called the first Chinese museum, or kind of uh, modes of encountering objects from the dynastic period, such as the Yaji literati gathering in which groups of people meet in a garden, take out objects and paintings and kind of discuss them. And I think going back to the start of Pan's talk, what you can add to this is also Fei Xiaotong's original vision of a Chinese national museum of uh, nationalities uh, that did not focus just on the other, but also include the Han self as well. I think this is a powerful critique of the Ethnological Museum in Europe that even today, uh, as curators, we're still wrestling with. Uh, you know, how do you get that, that balance? You know, how do you display ethnographic collections without othering them? And I'm sure Michael has some interesting comments to talk about this from an anthropological point of view. And of course, this is also said with the proviso that Faye Xiaotong's idea of the Chinese National Museum of Ethnology never really gets, or National Museum of, of Nationalities never really gets properly created. And the concept of an inclusive we-ness becomes increasingly problematic and unbalanced as the century progresses. But that leads me finally to what kind of Pan finished with, which was this idea of the anthropological perspective in museums. And I think, you know, it has a question, what does an anthropological perspective in museums look like? And I think that one important factor is escaping the constraints of linearity in museum narrative. So Pan talked about that, the grand narrative, presenting a different type of narrative. How do you go about doing this as an exhibition maker? I think one kind of example that Pan shows is the idea of uh, linearity in, in chronology and time being replaced by something like circularity, which we saw in that uh, exhibit Sewing in Time, the Yi, uh, the Yi different dyed fabrics, 365 going in a circle for one day of the year. And maybe also what perhaps you didn't quite get from the video in tradition at present, it, that within the Hangzhou version is when you get to the end, you return to the beginning. So there's this idea of circularity, which, re, uh, which goes to other ways of cosmological views of it, looking at time, which allow you to escape linearity. And I'm just going to I'm just going to go back to Pan and say, is there anything you'd like to say in relation to how you go about including an anthropological perspective in exhibition narratives, Pan? Okay, so can you hear my voice? Yeah, okay. Um, I think I need to answer the question that uh, raised by um, Yu Sheng Bai. And after that, I'm going to answer David's question because I think it's a good way to uh, combine these two questions together about um, um, Yu Sheng Bai's uh, question is, what is the local people's understanding of authenticity? It's actually a very, very interesting question. Like the case that I raised of uh, Du Long, fabric making. Um, I only use the example of the, 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 the designers. But the problem is when those designers, when those um, team, these interpreters, um, invite those group of uh, Dulong women to a big city and ask them to, um, to learn the new skill and use the wool or um, cashmere and redesign their patterns of the, of the fabric. Um, they really don't like it. They say this is this is not colorful at all. This is just not beautiful. This is not our style. And why cashmere is unstable. We don't really like it. So um, that's their understanding of authenticity. But they don't really think there is a so-called authenticity because they're culture, their color, their fabric, their uh, dresses was changed all the time. They have their own fashion. They are not really frozen in time or in the museum closet. Even their colorful customs, if you go into the details, it changed all the time. 
yeah, they have their own fashion. They will use lace, they will use cotton, they will use some new modern materials to make it. So they don't think there is a so-called authenticity. And back to uh, David's question, as an apologies, what kind of material to use? What kind of um, things that we're going to uh, do to make an exhibition? I think the most important thing is to invite all these, all kinds of voice into that exhibition. We have to let people know, we have to let uh, those people, those ethnic minorities have their own voice. If they hate a pattern, if they hate the fabric, then they will be able to have their own voice. That make a real feel sense of the exhibition. We will not just make some beautiful installation. We will not just let people know how beautiful it can be redesigned. Um, we have to show different voice. I think that's the most important part of the so-called um, anthropological perspective. The fear sense. I think that's the most important thing. So we've got, we've got a question from Harriet Evans. Um, mm -hmm. Mike, do you want do you want to come in here as well at, at, at this stage and um... about Eunice and but you know not to interrupt on Harriet who wants to speak as well. Um, just on the point of I think of, of the idea of newness and innovation. Uh, we have this, there's a sort of paradox here, it seems to me, that on the one hand, the 55 minorities are seen in very frozen terms, you know, each person with their particular costume color, etc. And it all seems to be very false. And yet, you know, as Pan just said, uh, they are very actually quite uh, identified with the uh, colors and the vibrancy of the materials. And when, they're when they go out to a designer and the designer turns their material into something that will sell, you know, in the West or whatever, or in some kind of idea of urban modernity, they don't like it. You know, so, you know, we need a much more flexible idea of newness, perhaps, rather than just simply the fossil you know, frozen 55 minorities and there being something else underneath it all which is much more creative and innovative. And for that we need, you know, the ethnography to be done, you know, in order to, uh, you know, establish what that reality of value is, you know, within uh, these perceptions of colour and texture and material and how it has always been open to newness because we know from the ritual world, for example, like in uh, Yunnan, um, groups like the Bai or the uh, Nashi, they've always been open to Tibetan Buddhism and influences from Tibet or open to uh, influences from Han China going back, you know, to the 19th century, if not earlier. So we need a lot more, you know, basic uh, understanding of this rather than these polarizations between fossil, fossil frozen images and something modern and dynamic that's going to come in, you know, and make it all new. But I think, um, I think you said Harriet, had, Harriet Evans had a question as well. Oh, thank you, Harriet, for your question. Um, and I'm going to answer both Harriet and uh, uh, Mike's question. Um, the insiders going out, of course, but uh, it was actually quite random. Like, um, but basically, um, if some like interviewers come to the community, they were definitely going to choose some people that is younger, more active, and try to um, maybe have the ability for the community building. So um, like in the Dulong case, and all the case that I mentioned in, um, in, 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 in the presentation, um, it's actually the young artist herself that because he, um, he can go to, she can go to college and because she can go to college and learn modern arts. So when she came back, she can try to ask even the, um, 
the, the male master to teach her how to make statues. Um, normally, it was been forbidden for female um, artists to make the statue because it's for temple. But now she has the chance. But for those um, like uh, foundations or um, interviewers, um, basically they will choose those um, young generation, not going to be the skillful person, but the younger generation. Um, so um, actually, the, the the criteria of the uh, the, the, uh, the, the criteria that balance local cultural practice with interest in economics is sustainable underwriting to the idea of um, the community that was um, um, actually it's not been organized so um, I'm not quite sure how to how to explain this 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 question but probably after a long-term field work we may be able to to, to get to know more in about um, Max's question, um, here is the problem that we all understand that uh, ethnic culture has never been frozen in time or in um, somewhere, but in museums, because according to the collective uh, collection management, uh, museums can only collect things with history or with authenticity. So um, in that case, in museums, we saw those frozen culture that in even we have to invite like uh, experts to identify whether it's, in, it's old enough or it's authentic enough. So um, although we all understand that there are all kinds of inference from different ways, but in the museums, when people that don't know Chinese uh, ethnic minorities that well, when they go to the museums, the impression she or he might get was uh, frozen groups that um, even the terms they use was like Asian, like um, tradition, like O in some terms like that to emphasize the authenticity. That's what our, our museum staffs always do. That's kind of very sad reality. Also, even uh, even the museum um, person, like well, we have a case like uh, we saw a dress with lace um, it was very beautiful and obviously it's been influenced by the kind of like a, the new fashion. But can we buy a dress like that? No, it's not for the museums. It might be, it might be able to sell in the um, maybe some um, global market or even be sold in a local market, but it's not for the museums. So normal audience, when they came to the museum, they're not going to see lace in those uh, ethnic customs. So there are two separate walls in the museum and out of the museum. But, um, but that's about to change, isn't it? Um, with the uh, China Craft Project and the, the, the potential uh, exhibition as the outcome, as the outcome of it. I, I know that you, uh, you've been actively sort of trying to acquire um, objects that represent a kind of a new um, level of um, sort of um, a new level of involvement of the influence, aesthetic influence or, or design um, thinking from the outside. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking specifically of Nam's uh, work, the Dai uh, pottery work, as um, an example of so the museum or your museum is acquiring um, into this collections sort of sort of um, objects that represent a kind of the latest sort of stage of the um, let's say involvement of of, of um, ethnic crafts. Is that is that right? Mm. Yeah, actually, that's a. Uh, you know, the, the, the museum management was kind of a very complicated uh, way in, in China, like um, crops, uh, ICH was um, basically um, is not for those kind of historical museums. All museums use, um, uh, or national museums. Modern art is not the, the, the artifact that need to be collected. So um, they have a different um, place to display the ICH. 
normally will be um, displayed as a living culture. And the way they do that, do that is invite like a uh, craftsman or maybe some uh, performance to perform in front of people. Mm, but that kind of craft is not for museum collection. Just, uh, I'm not sure if my, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I just wanted to thank everybody as well. I know we want to open up questions more widely, uh, but I, I feel that there's a really interesting layering of ideas of newness and transformation in terms of how that, you know, kind of, uh, comes together or you know kind of contests each other so you have the designers the artists the ethnographers people themselves and of, of course these categories blur um, but also the idea of what you collect on a basic level you know ideas then opening up and ideas of authenticity ideas of who is self who is other so I find it a very dynamic model that you've shown us, you know, and particularly, you know, the, the amazing images um, that Pan showed us as to how to open up all of those conversations, you know, the museum profession, you know, curatorial collections, all of those things come into conversation in a way that is difficult, but you can see how that, that kind of newness, as, as I think um, David said, you know, rediscovery of the past, and things like diversity of the past, as well as, you know, seeing that <laughs> in everything rather than just updating as if the new comes now. So I, I just found it a very rich layering um, of all of these things and how they are, they are in a sense, transforming and, and the model of the, you know, exhibition shows that itself. Um, so, so, and I, I, you know, some might be more slow perhaps than others, or some might be triggered than others. Some people in a profession might be frustrated as well by the ideas of, you know, perhaps, you know, museum ideas of authenticity and institutional framings of that. But I, I found a very interesting modeling of that. I wondered if we can, um, we have a, um, question and answer box that's going on there and we've got another question I think uh, for Pan at the moment. Oh. Uh, um, what are the impacts of these projects on the um, ethnic minority communities uh, you worked with like the Dai and other communities in terms of their cultural identities and sense of belonging? Um, so um well, because the, um, we did actually try to interview people about their um, impression of the, like, that kind of project. Um, in fact, um, like in the tradition at Parkson exhibition, when we try to, the, the, I mean, the, the first exhibition was being held in um, an ethnic university in Ningxia, which is quite, uh, that we have at least more than 26 different ethnic groups, students from more than 26 different uh, ethnic groups. Um, they all try to find um, staff from their own group. They all try to link themselves with the you know, Chinese nation as a whole. And when we come to um, each, each station, um, audience will ask uh, how many ethnic groups, how many um, closings that you print to, to, to this city. They all try to find themselves. So um, I'm not quite sure about if they help to, um, like in terms of um, building their cu uh, cultural identity, but they do try to find themselves in that so-called big family. That's the um, kind of like the, the way they always like to do. In, so for in exhibition, they try to find themselves. But for that kind of project, like Durong project, like those projects that we uh, um, witnessed, the people, when, when they facing that kind of project, um, basically all the, those like women in, from Durong or women from Miao or women from Yi, um, when they come to big cities, they try to re-understand their culture. They try to, try to find 
try to get to know more about their own culture. We have a case that in, in it was two years ago, it's another um, woman from Miao uh, community was being invited to Beijing and she was asked to design um, a new pattern um, that using their own um, accent elements. But um, she was not so happy, but still, um, through that kind of um, project, she gets to know that our culture was quite unique. We would have been so different. And those quite a lot of artists get to know our culture. They know our culture and they love our culture. So it kind of shakes the, the, the pride of them. But as you know, it's an ongoing, ex uh, ongoing project. We still have to get to know more about this. That's what I already thought, but probably we can find more from the further field work. I wonder if we can invite any more questions, if you could type those into the question and answer section. Um, I, I actually just wanted to ask Lee as well, because um, you commented on the idea of craft being a cultural value. <clears throat> and I wondered if you could you know, kind of focus more on, in on that, because that sounds, you know, an, a very interesting dynamic. Thanks. I mean, um, well, craft um, has or the, the, the term or, or, or what it stands for is, um, has become more and more present, more and more visible um, and nowadays, which is at, at least sort of, um, the impression that we got. Um, there, there, there are certainly a lot more talk about it in, uh, in, in China, um, not necessarily adopting the um, term craft, but uh, there's a set of kind of a, a, a lexicon uh, uh, that's sort of associated that and, and could sort of rapidly translate sort of what sort of people would, would, would take from uh, you know, the, the term craft. Um, in English, um, and the lex um, and the lexicon or the vocabulary it, it involves um, kind of terms like handmade or, or the, the, the you know artisan, um, their Chinese uh, equivalents, um, and um, it's, it's really a um, um, sort of yearning for or desire for quality for um, sort of time tested um, quality as a. I, I, I would, you know, think as a kind of reactionary um, sort of um, uh, sort of pursuit um, in in the, in the context of you know everything becoming you know uh, faster and faster and you know uh, mass produced and um, you know and and that's a you know a, a very you know general but um, you know very much sort of felt uh, sort of trend and um, desire and that's been you know, very swiftly sort of picked up by, again, uh, the, the economy and uh, the, you know, uh, uh, very, you know, soon once that's been sort of expressed and then it's been captured by uh, a, a business sort of ventures and turned into a kind of business niche. So it sort of falls into sort of the trap that it tries to get out of in, in, in a way and it became so, so quality or craft has became this um, um, almost um, a trademark or, or kind of a niche selling point for. Um, so, because the one thing that we sort of mentioned but but but, but didn't quite sort of um, engage is the the idea of the ICH in China, which is I mean of a, of a you know a highly relevant to uh, uh, um, you know the heritage field and. Uh, uh, the ICH in, in China has been, you know, partly or, you know, to, to a great extent sort of industrialized. You know, you have the um, intangible cultural heritage transmitters, which sort of are uh, awarded, you know, by a kind of a national you know, standard criteria. And they turn themselves to be, to be sort of, you know, um, entrepreneurially, you know, successful, uh, you know, uh, people who produce, you know, who, you know, have a group of, um, people and produce um, sort of products, you know, under the brand that um, their status as transmitters have sort of um, um, endowed upon sort of their craft. So that's sort of, you know, generally what I can sort of think of the, um, um, so it's, 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 a, it's, a, 
it's a larger sort of ongoing phenomena there. Well, we have more questions. Um, yeah, thank you. We've got questions coming in. So John Reeve has asked, have you compared your situation with the exam, for, for example, with India, where museums tend to fix ethnic groups by costume, material, culture and homes? Um, can, can everybody read that question on the panel? I don't know who wants to respond to that one. Uh. So Pan just said, Pan will return. I think so. we'll return I, think I, I can respond to John's question because I think yeah. um, that's really interesting in terms of one of our um, sort of designers, uh, Ziwi Long Hong, who we're working with, who's from the Norsu ethnic minority um, and runs soft mountains kind of jewellery. She looks towards some of those Indian sustainable fashion designers in terms of what, how she's kind of um, uh, positioning uh, herself. Now, what's interesting, I guess, is she's not um, specifically looking at other ethnic minority groups, but she's looking at the example of saris and how saris have been positioned as uh, kind of a, as contemporary fashion as one thing that she's kind of in dialogue with. And I think one of the things she's really interested in is the kind of the ethical side of fashion that's presented within India in, in relation to that. That's a kind of um, a, a discourse and a dialogue that she's she's drawing inspiration from within her own within her own work. We, all, we also have another question from Harriet. Um, I'd like to hear everyone's thoughts in response to David's question about how to create an exhibition that doesn't other ethnic groups. Are there examples that come to mind? Over to David. <laughs> well, I asked the question rather than giving the solution. I suppose what's quite I suppose what's quite interesting, I think, is the shift from tradition at present. And um, this also relates back to uh Xiao Ma's question in terms of how are the um the Han um uh, uh represented. Uh, or oh, sorry, it wasn't it wasn't Shamar. It was um, yeah, it was Rick, Ricardo uh, yeah. Brosh. Sorry, there's a double question that actually feed into each other. You're yeah. right. Yeah. So, so within tradition at present, that moves around to different um, to different museums. It's a touring, traveling exhibition. Who Pan's joined us, and then it often responds to the collection within those uh, museums. So, for example, within Hangzhou, which was the um, the visit that we were uh, that we went on last to see tradition at present, there the the collection from the Hangzhou Museum, which is mostly Han, is brought into dialogue with those collections coming from the Chinese National Museum of Ethnology, and then I think I think what's kind of interesting is that this this shift from tradition at present to the China Craft Exhibition to answer Harriet's question, whereby rather than saying okay here's the Han and his, you know, his all the ethnicities together. China Craft is looking at one specific kind of craft at a time from one kind of uh, ethnic minority group. And I think within that, you're then able to provide a kind of cosmological view uh, and just allow more time. And I think this goes back to that question about, you know, the anthropological perspective. How do you replicate what goes into all of those hours of field work and thick descriptions within an exhibition space. And I think there's also going back to Fei Xiaotong's original vision and that hand question is that idea of weeness. So rather than, you know, this dichotomy of self and other, which is in a European museum perspective, there's this idea in China of things existing together in this weeness, in this duality. And whereas, from my initial perspective, from a European perspective, that felt very attractive. Then as you read more about it, there's more that it becomes more problematic because there's often this status in which the Han are represented as the big brother, the ethnic minorities as the little brother. And there's this kind of, or the Han at the center and the ethnic minorities at the periphery. So there's all these kind of traps that you have to kind of escape as a museum exhibition maker, which is, which I think is very true within any kind of you know within creating anthropological museums in within within Europe that there's a long history if you look at the British Museum collections how do they do that presenting African culture as contemporary art but as a result you pull it away from having any kind of historical context and so I think 
Uh, to finish, I think it's a very difficult. It's a very difficult uh, thing to do. Of what Harriet's saying is to escape those kind of discourses. But I'd be interested to to hear what other people have to say, or also any suggestions from that of examples within the Q and A. <laughs> Could I just say? I mean, Pan already sort of gave us some idea of the idea the the people already are in a way dissolving these kind of ideas of seeing themselves as uh, separate or other uh, so the, uh, the the kind of ethnic entrepreneurs that go out to Thailand and to India and Europe and whatever and they don't just sort of uh, apparently just say oh well you know let's just make whatever they we think they want sort of thing they actually are quite active in um, bringing the outside in to what they do and seeing it in you know very clearly uh, their own personal terms and yet you know that's sort of not something that is kind of other and we or whatever and that fits in much more to an idea of difference anyway within anthropology i mean you only have to go back to you know frederick bass and ethnic groups and boundaries you know to say that you know you've never had just single fixed ethnic groups. I mean, it's always about being able to emphasize difference through, you know, that the represent relationship to the bringing the outside in. And I, it sounds like, you know, if one just sort of follows what you're doing, actually, these sort of ethnic entrepreneurs responding to China's opening up of the creative economy, etc. You know, you just, find, just follow them and you'll see that they're already, you know, dissolving the difference that they never felt they had in perhaps in that in that way in the first place. Thank you. I think we've exceeded our time, but we're, we're we are able to go on if we have other questions or if we have other comments to make. Um, so I'm just wondering if anybody else wanted to type in any questions or whether Pan wanted to respond to. Uh, Ricardo's um, question. Yes, I am not so good at Zoom. Um, as I remember, I have two other questions, but uh, you know, since I just lost, so um, as I remember, some um, some people um, raised a question about the example of Han Chinese. Well. Go to British Museum. Basically, it's exactly the same. Pottery, frozen, yeah, uh, that exactly the same. Brilliant history, yeah, that's all. Yeah, so you can if you go to any uh, like national museum, uh, the Chinese National Museum, and if you go to any provincial museum, that was um, cultural relax was basically the same um, to show the brilliant culture. And the other question, as I remember, is whether I compare the example with the Indian case, um, and also if the, um, the 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 pattern was being used by designers freely. Um, actually, a lot of designers came to ethnic um, areas to make their own design. Yes, they can use the all the patterns and all everything freely. Yeah, but um, if you only some like foundations or like UNESCO and some big uh, company will go to the, the place for some maybe for some reason yeah so but still uh, as you ask they can go there freely they can use the, 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 the all the elements freely in um, about the Indian case well I hope maybe someday I'm going to we'll be able to find more budgets to maybe carry on those projects in so that we can do that kind of compare comparison yeah i don't i don't think we've currently got any more Thank questions harriet. i think harriet's gone <laughs> harriet's <laughs> thanked us to, for a lovely way to spend a rainy morning in London. Um, have, do we have any more questions at all? Or any more comments that the panel want to make at all? I mean, just on that um, note of sort of designers um, going into ethnic uh, communities to find inspiration and um, uh, 
um, for for their own uh, design and to um, which is which is not entirely a new uh, sort of practice. And um, I think that that kind of intention of um, a representative of, of modern of, of modernity um, sort of reaching in and find elements that's useful in sort of in, in any sort of um, aesthetic or cultural ways um, to be sort of uh, brought back to um, to the platforms of, of, of the sort of a modern stage it's been a practice that went hand in hand with the establishment of the ethnicity uh, of, of the um, let's call it the ethnic um, structure um, in China the idea of or even sort of happened before that and um, um, perhaps the um, sort of reason it could be traced back to the um, sort of modernization from the early 20th century and uh, the efforts to you know study but that that happened sort of within the idea of sort of um, finding styles or perhaps that's a, it's a, it's a bad translation of the idea of typhoon um, um, it happens sort of firstly in, in the sort of musical uh, way to find the um, kind of um, uh, ethnomusicological musicological, um, sort of effort to find something that but that the the ethnic elements musical elements melodic or, 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 or instruments or sounds that could be used to compose uh, or to create kind of songs um, that's for the, the, the you know the, the, the broader um, audience the broader national audience that's that's you know taken um, into sort of musical or artistic um, creations that stand for you know China as a as a whole as you know the the the, 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 the cultural you know we um, the, the the collective subject of, of and, and 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 now it seems it's it's uh, first of all the subject of, of, of going in has sort of extended beyond sort of um, China but um, now you know um, ethnic cultures are becoming more and more accessible um, to global um, agencies and and but, but it seems that um, it's still the the same sort of um, um, dynamism you know happening there and uh, but um, uh, in the same time there's a sort of a higher degree of sort of this turn of design the power of, of, of modern design being sort of taken in and absorbed as, as Mike said um, and it, it, so well that's just um, that's just a reflection could I, could I ask could I ask Pan how she sees you know the future of the National Museum? Uh, in this, uh, you know, world of, uh, you know, change and transformation in China, uh, is the National Museum of Ethnology, it's not a question whether it's going to have a, its own building as such, but because it travels a lot and it uh, is very flexible and fluid, in many ways it has uh, greater possibilities of innovation and change, perhaps, because, uh, because of that. Is that an advantage to, to you? You know, that in many ways, a national museum, uh, having a National Museum of Ethnology, you know, is something that uh, allows you to be more open and flexible in terms of the exhibitions uh, you can put on, and also how you relate to the ethnic minority areas. Well, um, actually, I think, um, even we have quite a lot like touring exhibitions, but still we have to fit a major task. And if we cannot find a, cannot um, make a major task, then you have no reason for the, for the state to make such a building, such a, spend that kind of money to construct a, a museum like that. So, the major thing is the tax to shape um, Chinese nation as a whole. Yeah, so you, you, you always have to do that. 
And but still, you can find maybe a lot of touring. Maybe you can do a lot of touring exhibition, like all the provincial museums or uh, even the uh, national museums of China or even those provincial museums of ethnology. You always have the chance to do touring exhibition, but without the major tax, without the Chinese nation as a whole, no building. So that's a very embarrassed question. Where is Chinese National Museum of Ethnology? And um, for uh, the museum, of course they try uh, maybe a lot of methods to link themselves with the local area. But um, actually, even here now, um, when we traveled, we do collection and we don't do field work. Um, if you say that you want to do some field work, you have to go back with some maybe um, artifacts to prove your your work or to legitimize your field work. That's kind of a very um, embarrassing situation, but that's a reality. And I can't, I'm not quite sure whether we're going to see changes, uh, but um, no, I don't, I, I can't see any changes within five years or in longer time. I mean, as a National Museum of Ethnology and this idea of it must address China, can it be a National Museum of Ethnology and a National Museum of Civilization? So you have, in a sense, the overall Jian Sha idea and also the recognition of difference and diversity within that idea of Jian Sha or civilization. Is that a way to uh, solve the problem of uh, the unity and diversity. Um, this needs to be the last question, but that's that's brilliant. So yeah, yeah. If if, yeah, if Pan yeah. would like to, add. yeah, we did try to raise this idea using Tianxia as a context, and maybe even use some um, like a common cosmology in maybe some something common that to avoid some uh, very sensitive um, questions or problems. But uh, it takes, uh, it needs a long time. And maybe it's um, the Chinese National Museum will be able to do that because they have much better collection and they have the um, legitimacy to, to do Tianxia, yeah. Yeah, that's my answer. Excellent. Thank you very much to everybody. Um, I, I, we've had quite a lot of participants here and some brilliant questions and some brilliant presentations. So thank you very much and a huge amount to think about. So obviously we could keep talking for ages. <laughs> we've got the warning to stop now. So, um, but thank you very, very much. And uh, I, I look forward to talking even more about all of this, but thank you.